with crises, the scholarship hub supporting critical research into states, ecologies and societies. My name is Catherine Gander. I'm an associate professor of American literature here in the English department at Maynooth. Before I introduce our guest speaker, I'm just going to run through a few little housekeeping things. I can't tell you where the exits are, you know where those are. This session will last approximately an hour and a quarter, an hour and 20 minutes. We are using a Zoom webinar, so this means that attendees outside of the host institution, the host department, are view only. But if you uh, would like to ask a question to the speaker, please do so after the talk um, and use the chat function. So we're not using the Q&A, that's just a bit too much, uh, but the chat function works really well. So if you have a question, do uh, pose it to uh, Lindsay in the chat function. She'll be able to see it if you choose all panellists or all attendees, everyone. I will be able to see it um, and we'll make sure we get to as many of those as possible. Um, this session is being recorded. Okay, thank you. We are thrilled to welcome Professor Lindsay Stonebridge virtually to Maynooth English. Um, Professor of Humanities and Human Rights at the University of Birmingham, Lindsay Stonebridge is the author and editor of several books, including The Destructive Element in 1998, Reading Melanie Klein with John Phillips in 1998, and the writing of anxiety in 2007 and most recently the judicial imagination writing after Nuremberg in 2011 which was winner of the British Academy Rosemary Crawsha Prize in 2014 and Placeless People, one of my favourites, writing Rights and Refugees uh, published in 2018 and winner of the Modernist Studies Association Best Book Prize in the year. She is currently writing a critical creative account of the relevance of Hannah Arendt's Thinking Today called Thinking Like Hannah Arendt, yes, which will be published by Jonathan Cape in 2022 and working on two collaborative global challenges projects, uh, Refugee Hosts and the Rights for Time Global Network. And the links for all of these books and projects are on the uh, Eventbrite uh, listing. Anyone familiar with Lindsay Stonebridge's work will know that she shares with Hannah Arendt, and I, I, I think of you both <laughs> interchangeably almost, Lindsay, um, that she shares with Hannah Arendt that rare ability to reach into different realms of knowledge and experience, historical, creative, political, ethical, philosophical, and show with clarity, patience, and brilliance, not only their relevance to our current uh, critical climate, but the falseness of the barriers that are so often erected between them. Her 2018 book, Placeless People, was heralded by Marianne Hirsch as re-envisaging uh, citizenship, justice and rights by asserting the power of thinking and writing in the face of mass displacement. That book shaped discourse on what, for want of a better phrase, we call the refugee crisis, tracing through the work of Arendt, uh, Simone Bay, Samuel Beckett, Yusuf M. Kazmia, and other 20th century writers, questions of sovereignty, cruelty, displacement, and humanism as they formed and informed what we assume to be human rights, that worldwide governance over suffering, to quote the book. Her next book, Writing and Writing, Literature in the Age of Human Rights, will be published by Oxford University Press, hopefully next month. And in it, Lindsay Stonebridge considers the development of human rights via modern literary history and argues eloquently and forcefully for a reconnection with the boldness and truth-telling of literature's moral imagination. What can we do, she asks, when, quote, not much about either human rights or the humanizing benefits of a literary education seems self-evident right now. It is from this forthcoming book that Professor Stonebridge will talk to us this evening. Lindsay, I am delighted to welcome you to our seminar series. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, um, Catherine. Um, and thank you. Thanks very much to the department um, for hosting me and for Catherine and for Tracy Flaherty for setting 
this up and um, thank you too to um, colleagues. I know teaching on Zoom, which we've all been doing for a few weeks, is exhausting. So the fact that you've rocked up to listen to someone else on Zoom at 5 p.m. on a Thursday um, is, um, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Catherine um, referred to my new book, Writing and Writing, which is on literature and human rights. I think actually um, the word book is quite a grand title. Um, it's really more of a, a collection of essays and articles. And those essays and articles came um, from two basic um, sources. The first was the course on literature and human rights that I taught um, at the University of East Anglia about eight years ago with the brilliant 18th century literary scholar Ross Wilson. And I really loved co-teaching that course. I mean, co-teaching is a, uh, such a pleasure anyway, um, because beginning with the 18th century allowed us to teach the big history of rights. So from Locke and Rousseau, um, the rights of man right up to the 20th century um, and modern human rights all through literature. And if you're like me and you think of literature as something to think with, that was such a good way of um, thinking about that history. And the claim that we were making in that class with um, students was that the historical development of literature was linked to the development of human rights. And we talked about how sometimes writing had helped that project of human rights, sometimes in very unexpected ways, and how sometimes it hadn't, and how it might be that some kind of habits of reading, books and the world can actually make things worse. And throughout all that, the rise and fall of sentiment and its later a more contemporary, um, slightly more bolshy cousin, empathy played a very big part in that story. So some of the essays came from my teaching um, notes and from conversations with those very brilliant and very um, politically engaged students. Now the second source of the essay came from some of the journalism I've been doing over the same period. And like I think many of us in universities, the utter appallingness of the last few years has meant I've taken public engagement more seriously and I've got out there a bit more and engaged. And the irony, I think, of course, was just at that moment when we were teaching students about human rights, cosmopolitanism, literary humanism, all those things were coming under sustained and very blatant attack, both from the new right and the what Yanis Varoufakis calls the ethno-nationalist internationale, the rise of autocracy, and all aided by this palpable return to a politics of hate and intolerance. So it was quite a weird experience. It was like we were teaching something that was disappearing in front of our eyes as we were teaching it. So if I put all the essays together, which I've tried to do in the book, I think the argument I've come up with over these past two years goes something a bit like this. Literature has historically been really important to making, keeping and challenging human rights. And that's part of my claim. However, a soft, rather soft literary humanitarianism has also crept into our conversations, which is hindering rather than helping just now. It's hindering because of the idea of expanding our personal empathy continues to cast human rights in terms of a liberal individualism, which has been blind to, partly because it's contributed to, not just the growth of inequality, but of legal and political impunity. So I think there's a kind of liberal, there's a, the, the, the whole focus on empathy and liberal individualism of reading has been blind to growing levels of inequality and levels of inequality, as, in, as you all know, over the last 20 years are, have become um, unprecedented since I think 1905, hand in hand with a legal and political impunity. My alternative pitch is that we need writers, we need them more than ever, to help write things, but not simply because they generate empathy for other people. That's only one side of the story but because the very best of them describe and give names to forms of injustice that often prove to um, prove difficult to be seen as human rights violations. So there's a problem with visibility and I think that writing um, addresses that problem of visibility. And this problem of visibility, I think, is largely because the terms of human rights are still blind 
at best to both racial and economic injustice, precisely as structural crimes, as precisely as structural crimes against humanity. So recently, just to give two very obvious examples, um, and my, both of them I talk about in the book, you can think of the, you know, look not me mate, um, sense of impunity that's hovering over the Grenfell Fire inquiry and how difficult it is to locate the crime. Um, we can think again also, and I'll talk a bit, a bit, a bit about this um, towards the end of my talk, of the deliberate degradation we find in migrant and detention regimes across the globe, which again is proving difficult to be evidenced as a crime. So that's the pitch. So um, what I thought I'd do just for a bit um, is explain these arguments in a little bit more detail. And I'm going to read with apologies. I know um, I'm stuck here in the Zoom room and now I'm going to read at you, but I'll, 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 I will try and be animated and cheerful as I talk about structural degradation, <laughs> racism and violations of human rights. But what I'm going to do um, is talk about extracts of the book in three parts. So in the first part, I'm going to talk about the recent history of human rights in the context of the humanities, which is the subject of this um, great seminar series that you guys have been organising. And why it is that human rights have come under attack from various directions. In the second part, I'm going to make a case for human rights in the humanities by aligning with arguments for decolonisation. So that's the middle bit. Finally, I turn to Hannah Arendt, no surprise, to suggest another frame for thinking about right, rights and writing. And then I put her work in a dialogue with the Iranian and Kurdish political theorist and writer Behuz Bushani. So once I start talking about Hannah Arendt, you know I'm about to shut up and you can go and find your own warm wine or cup of tea. Okay, so the first part, where have we been with human rights and humanities? over the last few years. Well, modern human rights emerged from basically three interrelated histories. The total war and genocide of the Second World War, the political and creative struggles of decolonization, and the ideological battles of the Cold War. Now each of these three intertwined histories have of course several literary histories too. From anti-colonial poetics to the post-colonial novel, from eye-watering levels of state investment in literature during the Cold War to the marketing of world literature in the global glory days of neoliberalism, from Holocaust testimony to the Samizdat underground literary networks, writing has always given expression to the many and often contradictory freedoms of human rights. Now, up until fairly recently, just as books by and large are usually considered all around good things, Human rights, too, were viewed as a kind of capacious umbrella under which progressives, liberals, pacifists, anti-racists, feminists, anti-colonialists, democratic socialists, internationalists and anti-communists could huddle, albeit in not exactly comfortable proximity. Now, the one freedom everyone seemed to agree on was the freedom of conscience, conscience which is why the symbol of human rights has so often been the pen. So the first strategy when Amnesty was founded in 1961, its first campaign was a letter writing campaign, which was really well chosen. Writing letters to prisoners of conscience, which is what they encourage people to do, and they've just, they relaunched that, uh, that same campaign a couple of years ago, was a way of showing your solidarity by exercising your own conscience. So you wrote your own letter because you were also defending the rights of other people to author their own lives. It was an ethos that was to characterize the development of human rights right through the 1970s and the 1980s. But in the years following the end of the Cold War, disenchantment began to set in, at least in the West. Elsewhere, of course, the enchantment had always been a bit more qualified. Struggles against oppression continued, but it became more difficult to disentangle political morality from real politics and the languages of human rights filtered across from local politics, activism, NGOs, writers and intellectuals into foreign policy, particularly American and European foreign policy, and increasingly centralised humanitarian initiatives and narratives. Pretty soon, 
botched humanitarian operations and an excess of administrative reason appear to be producing nearly as much suffering as they hoped to ease. Human rights and humanitarian agencies in this period kept on hearing the words development and sustainability, even as many they were trying to help explained what they also wanted was equality, liberty and justice. The bitter lesson that force always arrived too late to prevent genocide in this period had to be learned twice, first in Bosnia and then in Rwanda. Once learned, however, in practice, it proved difficult to keep the intervention humanitarian. Actively and responsibly aiming to protect human life by whatever means possible was one thing, but sending over a Joan to show how much you cared was another. Or was it? By the time evidence of torture and legal black holes emerged from the Second Gulf War, it was becoming difficult to tell what was a blurred line and what was a political lie. Not only did the West now think, appear to think that it owned human rights, it was also, on more than a few occasions, proving to be spectacularly bad at them. Now, it was at this point, which is sort of roughly um, sort of in the second decade of the 21st century, that scholars from the humanities started looking more critically at their relationship to human rights. And they did so partly, I think, to reclaim human rights from the bad history that was rapidly building up around them, certainly in the US and I think here too. So historian Lynn Hunt's influential book, Inventing Human Rights, which is 2007, for example, showed how in the 18th century, the revolutionary idea of a shared humanity grew to the extent that torture became far more repugnant to those living then than it seemed to be to many Americans living now. Other historians such as Samuel Moyne in The Last Utopia subjected the mythologies of modern human rights to even less flattering critique. In literary studies, scholars tracked the genealogies of human rights narratives, be they the self-justifications and rhetorical moral hazing of perpetrators and beneficiaries, I'm thinking here of the work of Joey Slaughter and Bruce Robbins, the exotic passions of the humanitarian helper, Slaughter again, or the testimonies, testimonies of victims who, deprived of rights, have more reason than most to create new languages for justice. In some respects, this focus on human rights in the humanities, of course, was a return to literary humanism, I think, by another route. Many of us would claim that literature has always been a strong co-creator of ideas about humanity and justice. And you know, we will note that the historical leaps in the bids for human equality have invariably come with innovations in form, genre and literary expression. So, for example, had Jefferson simply repeated, let's get independence done ad nauseum or make America great for the first time, things might not have worked out but well, they might have worked out differently. Had Frederick Douglass not forged a new genre that defined modern freedom, liberty itself, in opposition to colonial slavery, the testimonial form might have ended up merely being supplicatory rather than genuinely emancipatory. Had George Orwell not imagined a man restless enough to steal a pen and begin to write down his private thoughts in 1984, the totalitarian mind might have remained a theoretical abstraction. Literature has always been key in establishing human rights norms, and I think that history is pretty well documented. This all sounds really great until you remember that there are periods in which it is quite possible for societies to organise their norms in opposition to human rights, such as, for instance, now, the present. So when I was appointed as Professor of Humanities and Human Rights at the University of Birmingham in 2018, a job title my mother complains, always complains, has far too many humans in it. Um, my new colleague, the migration and citizenship expert Nando Sigona, joked quite seriously that the human rights part of my job was redundant before I'd even started. He meant this in two senses. First, most obviously, current attacks on human rights from the new right are a clear threat both to the idea of human rights and I think even much more seriously to the institutions that make them possible, such as courts, treaties, universities, look at Hungary, and maybe we don't need to look that far, NGOs and international bodies. But he also meant, second, that human rights had weakened themselves. 
that such was the fall of global credit in the idea of human rights that we were now reaching what Stephen Hopgood in 2013 had first described as the end times of human rights, from which I'm taking my title. Now, I would have also totally forgiven Nando if he'd not also pointed out the second part of my title, the humanities, was also at risk of redundancy. I think when I wrote that sentence this time last year, I hadn't realised how real it was. <laughs> but anyway, we'll come back to that maybe in the conversation. Teachers of humanities subjects have grown used to hearing that their subjects aren't doing so well over the ten, past 10 years. And one response, the response I've used, is often to point out that humanity isn't doing that great either just now, and to suggest that these two developments might just be related. Now, elite institutions will, of course, always have space for the arts and humanities. But when the kind of mass education that enables the creation of literary communities starts to disappear, I really think defenders of human rights need to take note. Educationalists in countries struggling daily with the realities and cross-generational legacies of war, mass displacement and trauma, such as Palestine and Rwanda, argue very strongly, and usually given the resources in vain, for the arts and humanities, because they understand the intimate connections between imagination, memory, hope, social and political justice. To nurture a love of reading, in the words of the Jordanian literacy activist, my colleague Rana Dajani, is more than a nice to have or simply a useful tool of social policy. It's a means of levering collective action at a level to create change. Literary communities, in short, matter to human rights. It's a small wonder then, perhaps in these very difficult contexts, that human rights are struggling to make sense to us today. For some of us, they are meaningless because they're so self-evident, surplus to requirement, a hindrance, not a protection. For others, they are meaningless because they are self-evidently absent. Okay, so that's the bad news. Um, Here's part two, with maybe some good news. All this context, all this history, hasn't meant that people have given up on either human rights, or indeed, thank God, um, for, on literature. And for a very straightforward and good reason. In the words of the former Secretary General of Amnesty International, Salil Shetty, human rights still exist because the abuse of power against the powerless persists at all levels. From the man who smashes his lover's body, to the greedy developers who clad their buildings with combustible material, to the corrupt regimes that backhand investments, to the governments that make lifting a drowning body out of the water a criminal act, to the legal, ludic, or legal, <laughs> ludic gamemanship of the UN Security Council, the powerful screw the powerless. That is the bottom line, and that, Shetty concluded his lecture, is we, why we need some rules of the game, why we need human rights. Now, Shetty's lecture, given just before he stood down from Amnesty in 2018, was entitled Decolonizing Human Rights. Now, by decolonizing, he didn't just mean getting rid of that fatal moral narcissism that tied colonialism and humanitarianism together in the first place. Nor was he referring simply to the critical narcissism that sees all human rights struggles through the historical lens of the West's failure to be as good as it bizarrely imagines it should be. A vanity that often casts even more shade over other fights for justice and equality that we might learn from. What Shetty also meant was that because human rights are also about the struggle against the abuse of power, they have also been caught up with the work and imagine, imagination of decolonization from their inception. Whether it be resisting the oppression of past and present colonizers, or of the new regimes and dictators that have replaced them, or of multinationals, or of the harvesting of lives and minds by global tech and AI. At this point, I think, I hope, we can begin to see how the decolonization of human rights and the decolonization of literary studies and the humanities might be part of a common project, which is what I'm advocating partly in the book.
Now, decolonizing literary studies with human rights in mind does not mean valorizing literature because of the way it humanizes people unlike yourself. Quite frankly, I think if you need a book to appreciate that there are other persons on the planet as human as you, in truth, your grasp of human rights is probably not that promising to begin with. The literary humanitarianism that encourages, encourages sympathy for the less fortunate historically belongs to the same humanitarianism that thought colonialism improved the lives of others, or that modern technological warfare could be made a little bit more manageable if we simply had some rules about how far we let soldiers and civilians suffer. Amputated limbs, forgettable, but sometimes unavoidable. Lungs filled with noxious gas? Oh, no. Well, hang on, Syria, maybe. Agonised and detailed description of your feelings when you stumbled across an escaped slave being tortured to death in a hanging cage in South Carolina in the 1780s. Correct cause letters from American farmer. Yes. Having the same man utter anything about his condition other than pitiful little bird-like death squawks? No. Literary forms, like political forms, come with hierarchies. When a writer or journalist says he is giving voice to a refugee by including her story in his prose, what he's probably doing is casting her in a narrative that remakes her life in a form he and his readers recognise as human because they're familiar with that particular genre of being human. At its best, this kind of writing forces us to reflect on the moral hall of mirrors we enter when we engage seriously with one another's lives. At its worst, it's simply bad writing, a punishment from the gods for thinking that we have the divine authority to be giving or taking away any other mortal's voice. Literary sentiment is important to human rights, I argue in the book, but not always because it might make some, sometimes make people better at them. As literary theorists have consistently argued Although reading undoubtedly nurtures empathetic feelings, there is disappointingly scant evidence to suggest that feeling warmth and interest in a character in a novel, or even people in general, means that we're more likely to feel generous towards those in the world who might be asking, just for instance, for a share of some of our economic and political, as well as our apparently plentiful imaginative resources. As James Baldwin observed in 1977, People can cry more easily than they can change. That's a quote from Baldwin. Excuse me a minute. Sorry, that was my son and husband having an argument outside my door. Right, so I'm just going to repeat that quote from James Baldwin from 1977. People can cry more easily than they can change. Okay, so maybe that's not quite the good news you might have hoped for in that section of my talk, but here's the last bit. The writers who interest me in the book and who I write about are necessary to human rights, I argue, not because they urge moral compassion, but because they create new imaginative terms by which it's possible to see injustice, not simply to regret it, but to comprehend it. And this is the um, Arendtian side of me that um, Catherine kindly, um, one of the biggest compliments I've ever had in my life, referred to at the beginning. The work of Hannah Arendt is really important to how I've come to think about the relationship of writing and writing. Arendt referred famously, as you all know, to the banality of evil, by which she meant not that Nazis were innocent, but that the yeasty lightness of modern horror creeps like a fungus into our political institutions, our lives and our words. Sometimes we can smell it like damp in an old sofa, but rarely do we see it until the rot is so pronounced that the whole thing collapses. This is the real atrocity, she claimed, the sheer thoughtlessness with which we cancel out other people's lives, even when we think we're not doing anything at all, and even sometimes when we're imagining we're doing good. There is a relationship, Arendt also said, between the banality of evil and the banality of language. Actually, she spoke about the banality of language um, when she was in her 20s, before she spoke about the banality of evil, which um, all literary scholars will 
helpful to pay attention to. The cliches, platitudes, half-baked metaphors, fact and value three words that churn through our public discourse are an index of the extent to which we're unable to hear the words of others. This is one of the reasons why I think it's proved so easy for regimes to pretend that some lives are expendable, superfluous and unimportant. In other words, today's human rights crises are also a catastrophic failure of resonance. Refugee and migrant writing between at least three languages, Arendt was one of the first to disclose what the human condition looked like under modern systems of oppression. And she invented new genres of political and history writing in order to do so, because like many who have spent time in detention centres and in endless queues for paperwork that may or may not see you over the border, she understood the intimacy between the way something is described and what is being described. She understood what it was like to try and survive in someone else's banality. You cannot destroy political oppression by using the same language, progress, race theory, theology and solution driven thinking as its architects, she thought. To accurately comprehend the reality you are in, you have to be creative. That's Arendt's lesson and I think it's a critically important one, one that's often overlooked in scholarship on our work, which tends to ignore the fact um, of just how innovative a writer she is. Now the sort of modern criminality Arendt describes is the kind of criminality that until it's too late hides in plain sight and seems to have neither authors nor agents who put the mould in the sofa. Nobody, or so it seems. She dates this new kind of impunity famously to the moment that the administrative barbarism of colonialism boomerang back, as she put it, to Europe to produce, finally, industrial scale genocide and a bureaucratic regime of nobody. And it's here, I think, that we might want to think about linking Arendt's analysis of totalitarianism with Shetty's argument that human rights are a form of decolonization. If the corpse factories, her words, are now closed, the colonial mindset that first created the historically new crime, new historically new crime, Crimes Against Humanity, in 1945, Nuremberg was famously the first trial ever to use the phrase Crimes Against Humanity, it's the first time it was, a, it was a charge, remains active. Nowhere more, perhaps, than in today's refugee and migrant regimes. So this is my final point, I should start to wind down now. The Iranian Kurdish writer Behouz Bashani wrote his book, which some of you all know, No Friend But the Mountains, whilst imprisoned in one of those regimes, the Australian one on Manus Island. He wrote um, mainly on WhatsApp messages, which he then sent his collaborator and translator, Omid Tavakian, who then translated and put the book um, together. Um, it was published in Australia in 2017, 2018, and um, in the US and the UK just last year. Like Arendt, although in very, very different circumstances, Bouchani created in this book a new genre of writing in order to give form and meaning to a specifically modern experience of powerlessness. And I can't overemphasize how significant this book is. Um, it's extraordinary. I mean, just it's extraordinary the, on the level of its prose, it's, it's Conradian. In, in, in its um, intimacy with um, fear and weariness. With its use of fantasy, um, Omid um, calls its horrific surrealism, or as part of a political theoretical thesis on the specific structure and regime of oppression that he's um, undergoing. So it is really a text to sit next to the origins of totalitarianism. And I can only think that the reason why it's not being more widely read is a symptom of actually the very system that Bosciani is describing and indicting. And hopefully we can come back and talk to that, talk about that when we get a chance to talk. Now, with the banality of evil, Arendt posed a question that's troubled human rights law and human rights lawyers ever since. How do we confront a system that seems to have inured itself against culpability? That was the point about Eichmann, not that he was innocent or 
you know, he's just a, an administrator. It was just really difficult to get hold of how the crime had happened. What do we do with forms of oppression that are morally thoughtless by design, with structured banality? With structured banality. And I kind of think maybe today's anguished humanitarian emoting, have they got no feeling? I mean, more and more of us are getting more and more emotional, more angry and frustrated, is actually the flip side of a reality in which political and commercial institutions, often hand in hand, have locked themselves in tight against accountability. So no, they have no feeling, they also have really good lawyers. Um, and it's this combination of, you know, a, a sort of crying out for, for, for justice and for another way of living, and this locking down. I mean, anyone, anyone I mean, it's a trivial um, example, anyone who works in a modern day university would try and find out who was responsible for that decision why they were responsible, what sense it makes, will know exactly what I, I'm talking about, albeit on a, a, a trivial level, or maybe not so trivial. So we still find it easier to cry, because it, nowadays it's so difficult to get to the causes of our grief. So we find it easier to cry, um, to repeat James Baldwin's plea, because it's so difficult to get to the causes of our grief. Now this is a strange enough world to live in when you have freedom of movement or even qualified freedom of movement, as most of us do now. But it's an impossible place to be if you're one of its prisoners. Quote, every prisoner is convinced that they or their group are the critical theorists of the systematic foundation, the chief analysts of the system's architecture, Bushani writes at one point in No Friend But The Mountains. Every prisoner is convinced that they're the critical theory theorists of the systematic foundation of the chief analyst of the system's architecture. And then he goes on, but the greatest difficulty is that no one could be held accountable. No one could be forced up against a wall and questioned. No one could be interrogated by asking them, you bastard, what's the philosophy behind these rules and regulations? Why, according to what logic, did you create these rules and regulations? Who are you? Close quote. In an open letter to Fatou um, Ben Souda, who's the chief prosecutor at the International Criminal Court, written just after Bouchani finally left Manus Island, this time last year, coming up to one year anniversary. The human rights lawyer Itamar Mann argued that no friend but the mountain should be submitted in evidence in a criminal case against the deliberate human degradation, which is now the new normal in border camps, detention centers and migrant prisons. She didn't reply. Still, it's a brilliant suggestion, I think, on two levels. First, Itamar Mann is asking us again to describe the logic or illogic of modern human rights violations. With Bushani, and I'd say with Arendt, he's direct, redirecting our attention away from the pitiful victim or object of liberal humanitarian compassion and towards the question of how we might legally and politically frame those inhumane structures of oppression that are hiding today in plain sight. Second, and finally, he's also asking us, and I hope this is what I'm also asking in the book, to consider what might happen if we really took the relationship between writing and writing seriously. What might human rights look like when the powerless begin to describe the violations done to them, not as objects of empathy, but as agents of understanding. So I think I'm going to stop there because I'm anxious to um, talk to everyone too. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lindsay. And those of us who do um, have panelist uh, functionality, if you could just unmute to, to give Lindsay a round of applause, please. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, that was fantastic. <laughs> and uh, some comments are coming in already on how fantastic that was. I'm sure there'll be many questions, both from the panelists and from the attendees. Um, I think maybe I'll just uh, kick off with uh, a kind of broad question, just picking up what you were talking about in that second part of your uh, fascinating talk today. Thank you. I'll be sure to get a, a copy of that book as soon as it comes out. Um, it just got me thinking, you know, when I was an undergraduate in the late 90s, 
um, so <laughs> showing my age, I remember reading, I remember reading Arendt's The Origins of uh, Totalitarianism, I remember reading Kafka and, and Beckett and a lot of white authors actually, and, and I think this is actually where English degrees have, have changed a lot. I remember thinking they were kind of encased in history, that they were done, that they belonged in the past. Um, and I guess I say this for two reasons, and one is that it's, it's, it's very important, as Arendt has argued, obviously, and as your work shows, to be able to keep that conversation with the past and to understand how, how literature and the humanities have always given expression and indeed shaped the kind of ideas and freedoms under that umbrella term of, of human rights. But the second has to do with, um, with whiteness and white supremacy and with various forms of, of, of colonialism. Um, and your argument uh, in, the, in, in the middle of that talk where you were, where you were quoting Shetty uh, about the um, decolonization of human rights, you made a really uh, important point that the, the, the practical and imaginative work of, of, of resisting the oppressions of past and present colonizers is kind of inextricably bound up with the decolonization of literary studies. Um, you know, a lot of us are trying to do that. Um, a lot of us are failing to do that. And it did also put me in mind of the, um, the, Gold, the recent Goldsmiths lectures by um, Bernadine Evaristo, who made a really strong plea for this too, and called out the kind of tokenism of some university kind of syllabi who have the kind of one other text, and so perpetuate that, that, that kind of single story. Um, so I was just wondering if you could speak just a little bit more about how you see these two um, decolonizing projects connecting and maybe how that relates to what you refer to as communities, so the literary communities and, and the political communities that, you, that you've been speaking about. Yeah, the great, great questions, which I mean, if I could answer, um, I would have failed to understand the question because I think there's no, e there's no easy or quick fix to decolonizing the humanities. And so, I mean, this is what I kind of, you know, and, and it was the same with feminism. And in, in some ways we went wrong there um, for failing, failing to get the intersectional point one, but also failing to recognize that no amount of Athena swanning or Athena swanning about, as I sometimes unkindly call it, um, you can't have another tick box and then say we're now doing decolonized literature, then you fail to understand the nature of literature and you fail to understand the demand for decolonization. And the reason why I think it's so difficult is it's because it's so profound. It's so, it, it reshapes the whole field of the humanities if you take decolonization seriously. It is not a tinkering about at the edges. Um, and I was thinking about this over the weekend because I was rereading James Baldwin's the fire next time because James Baldwin and Hannah Arendt, well, Hannah Arendt was very rude to James Baldwin, but also really, really liked some of his stuff. We can talk about Arendt's um, racism uh, as well in that context. But I was rereading the fire next time. Um, and there's a point in towards the end where Baldwin um, talks about um, how um, the white imagination, white liberal imagination always imagines that when it, even when it's trying to be good, that other people are going to rise up to its level. And he has this famous quote where he says, you know, um, Kennedy's just said that there'll be a president within um, you know, in the next 40 years. And so fire, fire next time is 1962. Um, and that was often quoted when Obama got in and without realizing that Baldwin was critical of that. Because he said, why do you think we want to be like you? And I'm thinking now, if anyone said, <laughs> Trump, what? <laughs> Oh, great. Thank you very much. <laughs> like, I think we can do better. And that I think we can do better is the whole point. It's, you, it's, it's, a, it's a norm shift. And it's not just a norm shift with nasty, obviously very obvious racist organization. It's a norm. It, it's it, it's, a, sh it's a, a call for, I mean, to go back to Paul Gilroy's point on this, on a planetary, and humanis planetary humanism, which will shift everything. And that's not going to be fixed um, by pushing around the syllabi. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's got to be a fundamental shift. And it's why it's so nasty at the moment, because I think, well, the atmosphere can be, there are lots of reasons why atmospheres can turn nasty, is I do think that um, things were fine once the centre could have you know, a few people in um, to look nice around the, 
meeting tables and in the classroom. But when resources, when you're under attack, when people are being made redundant, when resources are scant and they can genuinely see they're threatened, then things get really nasty and that's where we are yeah. now. So it doesn't answer your question because it's not up to me in some ways to address no. that question. It's up to me to roll over and let other people do it, which is kind of what I'm saying. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for that. I'm going to read a, a question or two from the comment boxes, but also from the panelists. If you have a question, just raise your hand. And okay, so Rita's next after this particular question here. This is from Dr. Natasha R. How does the current state COVID reframe or scrutinize or renegotiate our conversations on human rights issues? What are the challenges? So Natasha is thinking about uh, the pandemic um, in terms of human rights. Uh, we've seen how how various um, members of society have been affected uh, disproportionately by by the pandemic. We've also seen how it has kind of isolated and and made different kind or it maybe exacerbated certain communities. Mm -hmm. So she's asking how that particular state helps us or reframes the conversations on human rights issues. What are the challenges? She says. Yeah, the manifold. We had a. Um uh, talk today a group group meeting with our rights for time and which is a network um and uh my colleague um um Fakaruki from Brerut was reporting on you know what does what do rights mean when you're not just talking lockdown you're talking crackdown and what does that mean for refugees and migrant um communities who are being deprived of even more rights i think the challenges are, are really um huge. I mean, one thing what in, in the West and also elsewhere, what COVID has done has exposed um, those inequalities and injustices that were already apparent. Um, so, you know, um, um, you know, with you know, the fact that Black and Asian people get COVID worse, with the poor, with housing, with women, I mean, you know, all these things are going to be set back, um, are already being set back intolerably. Um, which are issues around economic and social and political equality. So there's that set of human rights. And then there's another set of human rights, which I think we need to talk more about, which is what happens when you have liberties taken away. And I think it's quite right that um, we're having those debates now at the parliamentary level and we weren't before. Um, but that's, but that, I mean, this is what I loved about teaching human rights because there's, you know, you could say, yes, but they're right wing human rights too. <laughs> um, and oh, isn't it complicated and messy? Um, so there, there are several things going on at, at once. And sometimes the results, you know, are, are kind of really counterintuitive. Like at one point, um, at the beginning of lockdown, um, people were let out of, my asylum seekers were let out of detention because, because their lawyers argued correctly that they couldn't be deported because there were no planes running. Yeah. Um, I mean, now that, 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 that has, has kind of reversed. Um, so I think on one hand, two things go back to this, it's a really great question. On the one hand, in terms of understanding human rights as questions to do with political and economic inequality, COVID is exposing that and making it visible um, in ways which I think are good um, for activism. On the other hand, COVID is going to be disastrous for human rights because already um, those who want to shut borders, those who quite like um, locking people down or cracking down are doing so with impunity. Those who are really quite happy that um, black healthcare workers will go into the front line and risk their lives and also quite happy that um, most women in their 30s with children have had to put their entire jobs and lost their jobs and maybe made redundant at levels that you know, others aren't. They're all, so for the right wing, COVID is, is, a, is a really good opportunity. Um, although not all of them would um, think, think like that because some of them are worried about um, hum, um, individual liberties issues as well. So it's really interesting. I wish it could be less interesting, but it's an interesting one. Thank you so much. Um, there are some more questions coming in on the comment book, but Rita had her hand up. So Rita Saka from Manus. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for this hugely thought-provoking talk. 
And I was particularly delighted to hear you say that we can't overemphasize how important No Friend But The Mountains is. We're actually very extremely lucky to uh, last year uh, organized an entire afternoon in our Arts and Humanities Institute dedicated to the work of Bushani last March when we could meet in person and Behruz was with us via Skype, uh, but his brilliant translator, collaborator, Omito Figian was here with us in person. Uh, and I completely agree that Bushani's work deserves very close reading and engagement. And I'm actually very much looking forward to teaching it to 200 students and a core module next uh, semester. But in your talk, you mentioned how Bushani presents us with uh, what appears like the madness of rules and regulations. And in the book itself, in No Friend But The Mountains, but also in his essay in uh, the collection, They Cannot Take the Sky, and his poem, Freedom in a Cage, he presents the persona of the poet Madman. And in that poem, he shifts from the description of an othered madman with allure to identifying himself as I am that very madman. And throughout his work, he really presents this creative madness of seeing differently and identifying differently, uh, some sort of defamiliarization um, in order to challenge, of course, the border industrial complex. But also there is in this reordering of the subject object relations throughout the work, a kind of political philosophical displacement that's both part of um, his aesthetics of horrific surrealism, but also part of a uh, kind of ethical politics of connection. But this solidarity is not only with the humans in the book or in any of the work, it's also with the natural environment. So I was wondering on that basis, how do you read the place of the rights of the other than human in human rights as presented in these literatures, particularly in the work of Behrouz? Michelle, so yeah, um, um, Pleased to hear you're teaching teaching the book and um, both Behus and Omid are wonderful interlocutors. I think I think you're absolutely right. I mean, you, and you've explained it better um, <laughs> than than I could have done. But I think I mean what I love about that role is the sense I kind of want to reclaim for literature, which is literature is something to think with, and Behus just does that brilliantly because you know suddenly there are bits in that book that are so lucid, but there are bits of that book you don't know what's going on. I mean, you literally are as lost as, you know, the um, chamomile flower on the mountain that is an extension of him. Um, um, so there, there, there is this um, capacious generosity towards the world at the heart of his um, ethos, which is why I would say he's a human rights, he's, 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 he's a human, I mean, he's lots of things um, that's there. But I would also, I mean, it's really interesting, you're trying to persuade people to read this book, and I'm sure you've had this too, Rita. People either call it, uh, oh yeah, that memoir, mm -hmm. it's actually a major work of political theory, <laughs> or they say the novel. I don't know if you've had this. And I think it's really interesting because people can't find the words, and it's often because they haven't read it, they think they know what it's going to be. And that's why I mean about that kind of culture of literary humanitarianism, it's actually blocking down a kind of more, I mean, I think, you know, Maruza's work is kind of politically normative in a way, like, you know, this is, you know, you're coming for somewhere where it is possible to be a different type of person in a different type of world. Um, I'm not sure if I answered your question because you, you explained it. You did, so, and particularly so. that image of the chamomile and all these movements across the text, of course, mm. when he moves from his own ribs, that image of bare life that is so yeah. much Arentian to the trunks of a mango tree that represents strength. All these images, as you said, these are a key to, to his ethics and aesthetics. Thanks mm. very much for that. Thank you, and then thanks, reader, and thanks, Lindsay, for that response. Here's a question from Eve Patton from Trinity College Dublin. Brilliant talk, thanks, she says. How much does the contemporary literary slash humanities activist, as you have described that role, inherit from older models of the public intellectual? Is that concept now redundant, given its range of difficult political associations? Yeah, that's a really good question. And some of the ways, some ways I think, yes, you're right. I mean, um, I always 
get a bit embarrassed when people say I'm a public intellectual. So it makes me sound one um, pompous and self opinionated, self righteous. And also, we don't have that that kind of culture. But I think on the one level, the old public intellectual um, has an impossible position in our culture at, at the moment, and what, and, what, and that is, in some ways, for bad reasons because we don't like intellectuals and there's a mistrust of experts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. On the other hand, I think if we're redefining what it means to be a thinking person in a functioning policy with a voice who might be good at expressing themselves or might be in the uh, unbelievably privileged position of having time to think and write about what's going on, has opened out. Um, and there are other voices um, that are um, claiming, going back to Beruz, um, Bushani uh, uh, and other others that are claiming different spaces. So I kind of feel, yeah, that that kind of the old um, you know, tatty jeans with a sparkle in his eye, smelling of whiskey, rather sweet but a bit irritating intellectual of my, when I was an undergraduate, Catherine, which is a long time ago, <laughs> has, has been replaced by something um, much more exciting. I think the, the kind of creative and intellectual activist spectrum at the moment is, is full of rather brilliant um, people challenging each other and, that, and the world they're in. So I kind of like, yeah, yeah, the, what, maybe we shouldn't mourn the demise of a certain kind of public intellectual because it always came with an authority that had a price. Mm. Thank you. Some of these questions are quite trying. This one is from uh, Professor Alexandra Peet. Uh, zooming in from Switzerland, I believe. Thank you so much, Food for Thought. Thank you for so much, Food for Thought. You reminded us of what Arendt says about being creative and not using the forms and language of the oppressors. I wonder if you could talk a little more about where you can see examples of this resistant creativity, formal, generic, linguistic, perhaps, uh, perhaps in Bruciani or other recent works. Yeah, th thank you, um, um, Alexandra. That's a great question. I've already spoken a bit about, about Bushani. Um, I think, you know, in Arendt, it's everywhere. And it's really interesting how people want to read her as a political theorist. So if you go back to the, um, well, she is, of course, a political theorist, but the Masha one. If you go back to the beginning of um, Origins of Totalitarianism in her introduction, when she says, I have, and usually historians write about things because they want to preserve them, you know, to keep them and stop them disappearing. Um, but I'm writing about something I wanted to destroy, which is totalitarianism. Um, so I had to do this differently. Um, and that's why she comes up with that tripart structure. So, you know, she didn't want to call it the book, The Origins of Totalitarianism. She wanted to call it um, um, The Burden of Our Times and then The Burden of Shame. Um, so in some ways, I think um, the best writers are always pushing. And there is a kind of rights connection there, because what you're constantly trying to do is find forms for the experience you're having. And the experience you're having is not that that's in not a position of power. <laughs> um, so that that relationship between political forms, historical forms and literary forms is very, very um, close and um, um, proximate um, and, and, and kind of always has been, I think, um, and, and is certainly um, the case with some of the, some more interesting writing that's that's coming coming out now. I mean, it's like the old kind of, you know, how do you give form to experience which is not recognised? When I'll just say one more thing. When Arendt taught um, political science um, at Cornell and Berkeley, um, Chicago New School, and the first time she caught, taught course in Berkeley. I mean, all her political science courses had a lot of literature on them. About a third of her syllabi had literature on them. And she was teaching Berkeley, white, Berkeley, well, mainly white, um, a notable occasion where she tutored um, um, African American Kantian. Um, and she said in her teaching notes, you know, I don't want to teach you political history from the point of view of victors. I want you to teach you political history from the perspective of those who suffered. Um, with the kind of dual meaning of something acting on you and also you know, pain um, history. And that's 
what um, literature allows you access to and that's why politics students must read literature. Um, so I think, you know, it, it's, it's often there. Um, yeah. And also why, you know, you get bad writing is bad writing. I, the older, older I get, it's like, I'm willing to call that out. Whereas the interesting writing is trying to put an experience that other people can't comprehend mm. or don't want to comprehend um, in, into words or into forms and often break those forms, going back to um, uh, Bushani. Mm. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, I have a, 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 a question that I'll, I'll, I'll come back to, I think, because another question's just come in from Philip McGowan. Uh, following Eve's question about the public intellectual figure, I wonder whether England, and I say England specifically as it is the driving nation for Brexit, I wonder whether the dominance of the right in England's lurch into the past with Brexit will make it much more difficult for academics in England to have the internationalist voice required to speak for rights and the right to writing. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Hi, uh, Philip. Question as well. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, yes, I think I was saying to um, Catherine, actually, the first um, paper talk I ever gave on literature and human rights was in Dublin at the RIA. And I often thought that um, Ireland is a much better place to have these conversations. Um, at the moment, and I also know from my Twitter feed, the times that I'm trolled don't tend to come tend to come from England and not other places. Oh yeah, America sometimes too, but not Ireland. That's not an invitation to troll me, by the way. So yes, yes, um, and people will move, and they're already moving. Um, and no, um, because um, I well, I have I have faith. I mean, I'm, the students, this generation of students who will be, if they could, God knows how, get the funding to be postgraduates and then writers and then thinkers, are articulate, are angry, and are forging something else. So maybe not. Um, but yeah, I do think it's kind of like we're, we're entering into kind of like our Vietnam moment. That um, you know in the in the late 60s, lots of really brilliant um, Americans left the States and came here. And I think that, that will there'll be a brain drain. Mm -hmm. Yes. OK, thanks. All right. Um, I'm going to move. So just to remind people that, that to ask questions in the chat function rather than the Q&A. However, we have one from Florian Metzer who asks a very short and sweet question. What is the place of humour in writing and writing? That's a really lovely um, question. Um, oh, I think it has a lot. I'm a great, um, and this is this is something I learned. Um, I'm a I'm a great lover of irony, um, which Arendt does very well and has got her into a lot of trouble. And I'm also a great fan of um, Denise Riley's perfect book on irony called The Words of Cells, where she situates irony in human. Um, and humour centre of um, identity politics because what you were doing with irony is often repeating back what's being said to us or said to you um, and in that work of repetition there's that's the work of critical dissonance I mean romantic German romanticism was so brilliant at this too um, so it's not novel but I think it has a huge huge um, role um, but on the other hand, if you do much public engagement, you think you're being clever and ironic. Um, it turns out, Laurent learnt this to the Eichmann trial, um, and you know, I, and I, you know, when she said at the Eichmann trial, she says, when I said that Eichmann um, was a committed Zionist, I was being ironic, <laughs> and nobody wanted to hear that, so they thought that's what she was saying. Um, and I did a piece on um, um, Brexit very early on, literally sort of two weeks after where um, it sort of started like stupid, stupid men with their stupid ideas. And I was being ironic. <laughs> I was sort of like quoting, because I actually, I think, you know, there's more to Brexit than um, stupid men. Although there are a lot of stupid men involved in Brexit, that's not what I was saying. 
and um, I was sort of like, this is typical, you know, they think everyone's stupid. And I was saying, actually, the rest of the piece was saying we should not do that. <laughs> the rest of the piece was saying you should never write your, um, you know, in democratic political debate, you should, you, uh, it's, not, it's not good enough to call people stupid. Um, so I've learned that you need to be a bit more careful. <laughs> Um, but actually, I think as a, as a critical, um, the critical dissonance which comes with irony is brilliant. And I also think so much, especially around human rights, because the, the piety, you know, all the way from the 18th century sentimental novel to the piety that you sometimes get now, and people are quite happy really with piety and sentiment. Going back to Beirut, they're not really happy with, you know, um, really clever anger, um, irony and other forms of of agency um yes yeah, this goes back to sort of people being very unhappy um very unhappy with women trying to be funny oh, yeah. so there's Sorry. more reason to do it yeah <laughs> thank you um okay just to remind the panelists that you can put your hand up and and ask something if you'd like to in the meantime we have chris lloyd hi chris um do you have thoughts on the rethinking of the human in your work um, just checking my mic is on. Yes, it is. I'm thinking of the broad movements toward the post-human, for instance, in the humanities, but also work by people like Sylvia Winter, who argued that human was always a normative category, white, cis, male, straight, able-bodied, etc. How do we keep that in mind when framing human rights? Mm -hmm. Hi, Chris. That's a great question. Um, yeah, but I've started to... Um, I think I had to read quite a lot of Heidegger again for this Arendt book, which I found quite painful in lots of ways. Um, and the post-humanist moment, I'm less, I'm a bit more cautious about in terms of its capacity for progressive politics than perhaps I was before, which is to say, that um, I, again with Paul Gilroy, um, there's a a, a, um, a plurality that I still think is to be rescued from the notion of humanism, which ex not expands but is to do with the otherness within the normative category of the human. So Rent writes about this um, rather brilliantly when she she talks about you know coming into the human condition there's always that who and you never know who you are that can only ever be in relation to um the other so there's this otherness at the heart of her definition of humanism or the human um because that what what worries me is that you know we can just i've lost my train of thought um but you know, in in in, I sort of don't want to give up on the idea of the human being a normative category because I can re I think we can reframe normative for, for precisely the kind of politics that I think posthumanism also wants, and I'm not willing to concede um, that to normative white men. <laughs> <laughs> um so i'm sort of that I, it's a very bundled um bungled answer to your to your question okay, i'll give some more um thought but i do think there's a way of reclaiming not reclaiming the reason all the wrong words of inventing categories of um a plurality at the heart of the human mm -hmm. okay that um yeah yeah, no, these are, these are tough tutties. Yeah. <laughs> They're coming at you. Um, we have uh, one from Moina Sullivan, who's in the New English. Hello, Lindsay. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Is this? Yeah. Is this yep. Thank you for an extraordinarily rich paper. It was really, really thought provoking. And in fact, I, it's it sent me off in so many directions that I've been struggling to think of um, how to ask these questions. So forgive me if they are a little bit... Um, you know, simple, <laughs> but I want, I'm interested in the way that environmentalists are rethinking the idea of rights discourse to extend it to the planet as a, a strategy. And I'm wondering what thoughts you have on that in terms of uh, the discussion of human rights. 
And I'm also really interested in the very, um, really subtle and nuanced uh, philosophical um, angles that you're taking. And I'm, I'm also aware of your work in psychoanalysis, and I'm wondering whether psychoanalytical perspectives intersect or qualify some of the philosophical positions which can quite often um, it become, um, it can be, become, I would, trapped is the wrong word, but um, I'm not quite sure, but become um, contained in words when psychoanalytical perspectives and neuroscientific perspectives um, are sort of inviting us to move into the relationship of the text to the body and to movement, and we're seeing much more embodiment in terms of perfor performance, poetry, and so forth. So I'm just interested in how with your background also in psychoanalysis that may um, be coming into the picture as well because with the philosophical um, um, I'm not sure whether that's making any sense but those are two questions. Mm -hmm. but, but, yeah. No, they're, they're great questions. I think that the work that's been done around rights and environment kind of goes back to, to Chris's question I think is really really exciting because in rethinking that link, which also means thinking about things like time, <laughs> temporality, custodianship, the future, in terms of rights, um, I think in, in, as, 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 you know, if, if this can be a new development um, for rights, it's really promising. That's the one side of it. The other side that's sort of not so promising is um, that the one of the reasons that um, human rights and environmental rights are so coming becoming so closely intertwined is because violations uh, against the planet are also violations against people. So when you, you sit in some policy meetings and people talk about, uh, and then there'll be the migrant crisis that will come from climate change. And there was these people who always try to put so many passive verbs into one sentence. Like, <laughs> um, um, but those two, um, things are so being thought together um, that I think potentially, I mean, especially some of the work that's been done around um, migration law, refugee law and environmental law is increasingly um, coming, coming together. So um, yes, I'm optimistic about, well, not optimistic, but um, I'm super um, excited about that, that, that development. Um, Psychoanalysis. I, I, my first my, my formation really was in in psychoanalysis, um, and still is in a way. But I think I th I got to a point. Um, I always think there's, there's two towering women in my life. One was Menly Klein, and and one was Hannah Arendt, and they're both quite uncompromising um, Jewish women from the mid twentieth century. But I think what where I where I kind of left psychoanalysis, although I have come back to it more recently, is the sense that um, the narrative was too strong and everything ended up being a, an old pass. <laughs> it's like, you know, all sexual relationships are an old pass, gender is an old pass, race is an old pass, this is another old pass. Um, and all we can do is sort of, you know, describe the old pass. And um, from a kind of political perspective, that, that to me seemed to be only half the argument um which is you know why you you find in a rent like the life of the mind you read some bits of that you think oh this could be lacan with you know except it's got verbs and bits in it that help you understand what, what what's going on because she really as do you know as did heidegger um who she's getting this from but turning it around to a politics rather than a, a kind of narcissistic um um auto philosophy the otherness in one and I do think there is a really strong political point about um, what it means to recognise otherness in the polity, in in politics. Um, um, and psychoanalysis does has helped us get get there. But there are things you need to do once you've done that, as well. So I'm not answering your question very well, but um, that's kind of where, where I am now. I think. Um, um, I'm aware of the time, but I'm also aware that. A a lot of people still have questions, we can't get through them all. 
Um, I may just ask you uh, just a couple more quickies. So um, this is from Alan Carmody. Um, I really like that your work can be applied in everyday relationships. Do you think that Arendt's work can help us understand the spectacular right-wing populism of recent years or does something like Naomi Klein's shock and awe better describe our current reality while Arendt's banality better describes good old-fashioned liberal mainstream political reality? Mm. Ooh, we love some good old-fashioned liberal mainstream political reality right now. I'm not sure it does. Um, I think you can put Klein and Arendt together and actually in the human condition, um, and actually in bits of um, origins of totalitarianism, she's there already. She says, um, and this is, she's not there, I mean, she's reading Rosa Luxemburg. So she says, um, imperial acquisition, globalization at this level will create two classes of people. There'll be, there'll be some um, who will have you know, political access rights, mobility and there will be others who will be just stuck in the dark background of difference. So I think um, there's a continuity um, between what she was describing in the, in the late 20th century and the um, neoliberal um, um, sense of th thriving on thriving on catastrophe but also um, thriving on the production of capital for capital's sake within an imperialist um, framework. So I do think there's a continuity. And I do think banality is very important to um, the neoliberal imagination. Because um, in some ways, I think um, what Arendt did was point out the banality. And what um, neoliberal formations do is they're banal and they don't care. Um, so there's no, you know, the banality is embraced as um, a political strategy which it might be if my god we can talk about you know chapter two the banality of evil chapter three mm. i think that's what's um different now but i do think it's it's on a on a on a continuum and yes of course i mean that's why rent was um got very popular you know the origins of totalitarianism um shot into the bestseller list when Trump came in people you know there's every time you turn on Twitter someone's quoting a rent at you and little bite-sized bits of her apologies if that's me um because of her analysis of how um a certain new kind of lying in politics has always been lying in politics feeds into the loneliness of modern day capitalism um and enables um, a culture without a, a lack of a political culture where there's no shared reality testing and I think that's quite a strong analysis although I would say that I think the Arendt we really need um, is the Arendt who understands statelessness and um, the outsider because um, there's, there's that kind of American version of you know critique of the social critique of a modern day um, American fascism but actually she was always coming at that um, from elsewhere. Um, so it's, it's not, I mean, I think it's a great analysis, but it sometimes obscures what else we should be looking at. Which is why in places people after rent, I say, you know, the political problems of now begin with, not the nation state, but statelessness, because it's only through statelessness that you can see, or migration, that you can see the nation state for what it is. Yeah. All right, um, I think we'll wrap up with just one or two more. It struck me, Andrew Clark says, in recent times, that phrases like systemic or structural yeah. have been frequently people who wouldn't dream of saying something as direct as racist government, police force, university. Mm. Does referring to systemic problems let too many people off the hook by making criticism vague and nebulous and spreading the blame a bit too thin? Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. Andrew, I think you're right, but I think when you're trying to explain to someone that structural means them, <laughs> because they're the guys who've got power, <laughs> um, then it can do, that's why, so I think, um, yes, but I also think, you know, nobody is ever racist or anti-Semitic, are they? I mean, it's, no, it's always the people who say, I think that was an anti-Semitic or racist comment who end up um, in trouble. Um, so I do think there's something about getting people to actually acknowledge, I mean, it goes back to the James Baldwin piece. Um, 
that it's them in their the structures in which they work and think that are the problem which is why i have so much problem with you know the, the sort of you know imagining people unlike ourselves when i kind of think what is needed is for people to imagine themselves a bit better i mean that would be really something that, you know um and their own um complicity and benefit um from that so that's why i think you know structural means you're well paid and you're not going um you're not you, you know you're not going in, into a ward to nurse a COVID patient because you're sitting behind your desk making rules about who does and doesn't nurse a COVID patient. Yeah, okay. That's what structural mean. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a, it's a good point. Yeah, a but that means lazy words, isn't it? So maybe when we're trying to structure, say, well, this, you know, the way you run things is frankly racist. I mean, that's, yeah. what we, that's what we mean, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm going to close with a, a related question and I just want to say thank you again, Lindsay, for just such a fantastic talk and such a, my, my such a pleasure engaging discussion with us all. Um, and just sort of picking up from what you were saying to Andrew there about people needing not just to imagine others but imagine themselves or reimagine themselves. You know, we talk about what literature does in terms of creating empathy, you know, um, and there's been a fair amount of scholarship on this and projects on this and ways in which storytelling can, can kind of um, trigger empathy in people. There's even been kind of neurological um, discussions about how um, yeah. neurons fire in the same way as if, you know, as, as if they would if this thing was happening to us, the mirror neuron kind of argument. Um, but, you know, like you say, you know, empathy is, is, a, is, is a bit of a suspect feeling to evoke. You know, it kind of maintains the status quo in some ways, and it allows what, uh, what Teju Cole kind of famously and controversially called the white savior industrial complex, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was just wondering if we could close with thinking about maybe just a better word to use than empathy when we're thinking about writing and writing, um, which might invoke the kind of thinking that you were talking about that reading and writing does, and also the sort of discomfort maybe that's necessary in, in, in literature to, to generate um, change. Mm. No, it's a great one. I mean, and the word I would propose is judgment. Um, and, um, and, and, that, and this is Kant, this is Kant. So in, in the critique of judgment, which is all about the critique of um, he talks about so this is about aesthetics which is what we do most of us um we teach um novels and the 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 thing for kant is what art does is as he says train the imagination to go visiting which isn't empathy it's visiting and it's it's an imaginative act you know and kant will talk about the kind of constructions of the imagination but what he always says is you know for judgment to be a judgment it has to take place with other people um, you know, within a kind of common sense framework, but with, with others, um, which is why I hate to say it again, but when Arendt reads Kant, she says, actually, the critique of judgment is about politics, because it's about how we judge together, which is the whole point of getting your imagination to go visiting things that you other wouldn't otherwise visit. So judgment is not just about thinking, which I think is often a massive arrogance that you can inhabit the life of someone yourself. That um, you know, and as Zadie Smith said, I mean, you know, literature is about otherness. It's usually as much as it, it plays with otherness. It's also about what we can't know about ourselves as, as well as other people. But that kind of sense of um, doing the work together, which is why the, the seminar is so important to the humanities too, is something that takes place in the social context. Um, there's no point in um, you know liking or not liking which is what judgment is is this good is this bad is this ugly do i like it do i not like it we don't have like buttons for ourselves do we i mean there'd be no point just sitting on the screen going i don't like that i like that i like that we do it on twitter or wherever we are because we're in a group it's like oh i like this <laughs> and we're, we're actually talking to everyone else on our feed and that's what we're doing when we're reading it is a kind of it's a social um, question of the most intimate imagination put out in the world. What you then do with that, because you can have horribly normative readings. I can remember being an undergraduate and told quite firmly um, by the then lecturer who I looked, Googled um, to see if he was still alive recently, and he is, but I'm not going to name him, who, um, having chatted up both me and my friend Jackie, 
who, who was black and Jackie and I both have issues with Heart of Darkness and he took us to one side um, after we both refused to go out for a drink with him and told us that black criticism and feminist criticism were a literary and that was an idea of sort of you know, literary judgment being set up in a racist sexist way explicitly but you know, rather than getting students to empathize um, or thinking that reading is about empathy what I think it is is around encounters with otherness which turn out to be questions of political and social judgment and that's where I think um, our work does relate back to things like well what do we think then can we agree on what rights are based on on that as, 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 as a collective political project. Well that is a, a wonderful answer and a perfect way to end the seminar so um, if you can unmute yourself please give me a, um, help me give Lindsay a round of applause. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Lindsay, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're going to conclude the, the seminar here. I'm sure we all have other things to do and places to be. But again, thank you so much for a really engaging and fascinating talk. And we can't wait to read your book and buy your book when it comes out. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's been really engaging at the end of week, whatever it is, to have these conversations, which allow bigger things than Twitter, so it's excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Yep.